welcome to Silent Movie Mondays, Cine Club for Comedy Classics by Seattle Theater Group. Good evening. My name is Vicki Lee, curator of the Silent Film Program. And this evening, our focus is Comedy Classics, three shorts by Charlie Chaplin, The Immigrant, Pawn Shop, and Easy Street, Buster Keaton's Sherlock Jr., and the third film is Marion Davies in the Red Mill. And I have with me on Zoom tonight, what I call the three J's, Jennifer, John, and Janice. All of them are scholars in silent film. All of them have been involved in Silent Movie Mondays, doing introductions and cine club. So we welcome their expertise tonight. We're gonna chat a while together and then um, after a while, we'll have a Q&A and those of you who are on and have questions in the, in the tradition of Cine Club, which is usually in the Paramount Bar. By the way, if you all have a glass of wine, you're welcome to, to have a little shot as we're, we're chatting along here. So we just wanna have fun tonight and just go deep into, well, we could talk for hours about each of these um, filmmakers, but um, we're gonna focus on, on these films tonight and why they're classics. So on our, on our uh, lineup tonight is Dr. Jennifer Bean, who is the Robert Joe Lynn Osborne Professor at the University of Washington in Cinema and Media Studies. Um, I have to say on a personal note, I defer to Jennifer all the time with um, her knowledge and particularly um, with women filmmakers. She's very involved in the feminist media studies and women, women filmmakers and preservation funds. So thank you. Welcome, Jennifer. Um, second on our J list is John Gordon Hill, um, does so many things is an instructor, director, producer, has done documentaries, film scoring, cinematography, um, just an all around filmmaker, a real asset to our Seattle community. Welcome, John, thanks for coming back. And Janice Finley, who I've known for many decades, first as a filmmaker, um, she focuses on, she's a nationally known filmmaker with a lot of experimental films, is an instructor at the Seattle Film Institute, a producer and all around fun gal and knows a lot about film. So here we go. First question and we're gonna go in the order of Jennifer, John and Janice. So Jennifer, you, you have done, I think you did your dissertation on Chaplin. Am I right on that? Mm. Or you've written about him anyway. <laughs> I have written, I, I don't remember my dissertation was so long ago. Okay, so what we want to what we want to focus focus on just to get the ball rolling is what is the significance of Chaplin, particularly with these shorts, these mutual shorts of the immigrant pawn shop and Easy Street. Right, right. Such a good question because, you know, when you hear so many of the the accolades that that Chaplin receives, if you think of uh, George Bernard Shaw called him the only genius to be produced. Uh, through motion pictures, or the film critic Andrew Saris, who said that Chaplin was uh, the single greatest artist uh, to come out of the cinema, uh, to be a part of the cinema. A lot of those kinds of accolades acknowledge the mutual period, this period in the 1910s that we're looking at, but they are also kind of thinking about the larger trajectory of Chaplin's career leading up to the 1950s to limelight, leading up to the 1940s to the great dictator, to the kind of 1930s uh, modern times, to the long life of the tramp. Um, the character that Chaplin created in this year that we're looking at. Yeah. Now, certainly it's worth keeping, it's important to keep in mind that Chaplin uh, first performed in motion pictures in 1914. He'd been uh, kind of in a comedy troupe, uh, came from England, came from a very poor background, uh, worked in comedy troupe that was traveling across the United States. When Max Sennett heard about him, saw him a bit, telegraphed him and said, come on over to California, we've got this new thing called motion pictures and off Chaplin went. But within two years, by the time the immigrant Easy Street and Pawn Shop are made, uh, he is the highest paid uh, motion picture performer he is the first greatest star, and he invents uh, a persona, a figure 
that is the tramp that we see come to life at this particular moment. And what I would say is that part of the life of the tramp, what's so important and phenomenal about it is that everyone from all walks of life, from all corners of the globe, imitated the tramp. Literally walking, dressing, it's the beginnings of what I think of as the phenomena that is mass culture in its most powerful, wonderful, humorous, laughable, performative sort. It transforms our lives and the best version of that begins with Charlie Chaplin and these films. I'll end by saying, keep in mind, it's also World War I. Right. And Chaplin begins in 1914, the beginning of the, the World War. There is one group of people that is well known that did not enjoy Chaplin during these years, and that's the Germans. Or as Blaise Sendrier would say in 1918, the reason the Germans lost the war is because they did not get to know Charlot in time. Charlot being the, the French word for Charlie. And because of the embargoes, uh, the Germans and, the, uh, uh, the, and their related forces did not have access to these films at that moment. And the rest of the world said, because they couldn't laugh, because they didn't have images and performances of, of Chaplin in the trenches, as all others did, uh, the war was lost. Thank you for that. Mass culture, a good phrase for it, and his international mm -hmm. reputation. Thank you. And we're going to riff off of some of what you said in a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. John, Buster Keaton, Sherlock Jr. It just so happened when I asked John to do this, he replied that this was his favorite silent film, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How lucky was that? Yeah. So what is the significance of this film in particular and Keaton? Well, Keaton looks both forward and backward, particularly in this film. Uh, he comes out of vaudeville. He's yeah. born in 1895, literally between shows in his parents' vaudeville act. <laughs> he was on the stage with his parents by nine months. And uh, they created a, a, an act called The Three Keatons that involved a lot of throwing people around, particularly mm -hmm. Buster. So he learned <laughs> how to take a fall from the time he was a toddler. And... Uh, uh, Supposedly his name, he was named Joseph was his original name, but his name Buster was supposedly given to him by Harry Houdini who watched him fall down a flight of stairs in a hotel and get up unhurt and said, wow, that was a Buster. I uh, heard that what, and the name it? stuck, it right? Stuck, yeah. Um, so he uh, was very involved in every aspect of vaudeville. He never got a formal education. He actually attended school for one day in his entire life. Uh, so he was basically uh, educated in all of the uh, performing arts of vaudeville at that time. He knew all the gags, he knew all the other actors, he knew all the other things going on. So by the time he was, you know, 17, 18 years old, he was an enormously uh, experienced performer. Mm -hmm. um, and he uh, went off to uh, World War I, came back. Uh, and Fatty Arbuckle, uh, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who Janice will be talking about shortly, uh, kind of befriended him and brought him to Hollywood to work with him in, uh, in his film company, the Comique Company, uh, creating these shorts with Fatty Arbuckle. And uh, Buster always regarded Fatty as one of his closest friends and uh, was all, and this factors into Sherlock Jr. very soon. Uh, so uh, Fatty Arbuckle set Buster up as an independent uh, filmmaker in studio mm -hmm. and sent a letter around to everybody he knew with Buster's picture saying, this guy is as funny as I am. You got to you got to <laughs> work with him. You got to give him a job. And uh, so after he left doing the, uh, the shorts with Fatty, he went on to um, start creating his own shorts and he created 19 shorts and then started to do the feature film work uh, in about 1923. And uh, this film is his third feature. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it has since being made, it has become you know, one of the classics, one of the great, great Keaton films. It's on the National Registry. Uh, he's, um, but at the time it was not well received. It was actually his lowest grossing uh, of, of any of his silent features. It made $450,000. 
They made it over five months uh, in late uh, 23, released it in April of 24. Um, and it is the work not just of Buster, and, and he is credited solely as director on it. There is considerable evidence that Fatty Arbuckle uh, directed a significant portion of Sherlock Jr. Yeah. And, uh -huh. uh, and certainly at that time, uh, this was around the time when Fatty's career had been absolutely destroyed uh, yeah. by this, this scandal, this young woman that, that died after attending a party at his house. And he was blamed for that and ended up being tried for it three times, acquitted each time. And the third time actually received an apology from the jury. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. They said it was such an unfair charge. But by that time, the damage had been done and he yeah. finished as a, as a public figure. And so he would direct under a pseudo pseudonyms or not credited at all. Um, so he had a major hand in, in Sherlock Jr., just how much we don't know exactly. The other persons that were key to making this were Clyde Bruckman, who yeah. was uh, Buster's gag man. And the way they made films in those days is they sat around and bought up gags. And a lot of times they went to a location or situation and figured out what they were going to do once they got there. They knew this had to happen and this had to happen in the storyline, but all of the particulars they worked out at the time. And, and Bruckman was, an, again, an old uh, Hollywood and vaudeville guy who knew all the tropes, knew everything, you know, and, and he was a great uh, spur for, for Buster. Uh, the other one, the other guy was Elgin Leslie, who mm -hmm. was Buster's uh, cameraman. And this is where we get to why Sherlock Jr is so amazing. Um, there had been films before that were meta. They studied, they, they were films about films or they made jokes about you know, the movies and how the movies worked. Buster was fascinated with uh, the concept of filmmaking and how filmmaking worked as an art form. Mm -hmm. uh, when, he, he, when he turned his back on vaudeville, he never went back because he loved the technical aspects of filmmaking. When he went to work for Fatty Arbuckle for the first time, the first day on the job, he said, can I take that camera home? <laughs> he took the camera home, took it completely apart, yeah. rebuilt it, technically understood how the camera worked, understood how the projectors worked, understood what was going on with the persistence of vision and the, and the editing and everything else. So that by the time he gets down to Sherlock Jr., he builds this whole film around this idea of a projectionist who falls asleep Brilliant. Brings his way into his movie. But there are two points that are like, <laughs> if, he, if he had had an academic background, it would have been a, a brilliant meta deconstruction of the filmmaking process. But, really? you know, instead it was, it was gags, right? And one of them was, why, how does a cut work? Why do, we, why do we accept a cut? If we had a cut happen in real life, we'd check ourselves into a mental institution because we would assume we would have had blacked out. But Buster understood it's a dream. You're in a dreamlike world. And if he puts his character, what if I divorce my character from the background that I'm cutting in? And so the, when he first goes into the film, the background keeps changing on him and he can't adjust to it. He keeps getting thrown off because these cuts keep happening. And how they made that, that's a whole nother technical aspect. But I will say that when the film was released, even though the public thought it was amusing and maybe they didn't yeah. embrace it for a bunch of other reasons, cinematographers went nuts. Yeah, They came to the theaters in droves trying to figure out how, how did he do that? I can imagine. And the other thing then at the end of the film, Buster uh, makes a comment on how films at that point were teaching us how to live, mm. how, do I kiss a girl? Yeah. How do I hug her? How do I, you know, he's trying to figure out how to be with his girlfriend by watching what's going on the screen. Right. And then of course, when he sees them with twins at the end, he reconsiders. The layers um, are deep, aren't they, John? Yeah. Well, and, and, and such an influence on other filmmakers too. No. Um, glad you mentioned Fatty Arbuckle because that's gonna segue into the third J, Janice because he directed under a pseudonym, Marion Davis in, in The Red Mill. So Marion, The Red Mill, Janice, oh yeah. gosh, she's got material. <laughs> <laughs> so Marion Davies, um, famous in a 
maybe more famous um, for being the very much younger girlfriend of a super uh, wealthy uh, media baron named William Randolph Hearst. Many, if you've heard of Marion Davis, you're well aware of that. And then maybe even more famous than that for being in a film or not being in a film, but being assumed that the character of Susan Alexander in the film Citizen Kane right. uh, kind of eclipsed her career and made people be very confused yeah. uh, about her and Susan Alexander. Uh, the picture that just came up um, on your screen uh, is uh, a still from the picture, The Red Mill, which was our featured film of Marion Davies. It's by the first uh, professional woman photographer, female photographer in Hollywood. Um, uh, and I'm hoping I've got her, I had her name here somewhere, Ruth, uh, Mar like, I'm spacing out, her last name's Louise, Ruth something Louise. Something. First woman yeah. professional photographer in Hollywood. Right, and she um, worked or ran uh, MGM uh, portrait studio for 1925 to 1930. Uh, and so she took all the stars pictures um, and had kind of a curious way of working um, that ended up kind of having her lose her job finally because it wasn't appreciated by people like Norma Shearer. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. So next photo um, is uh, a picture we're going to actually see uh, Fatty Arbuckle in the boat. Uh, it's, you're seeing him with the megaphone directing uh, and Marion Davies uh, over on the platform. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is one of the things with being the girlfriend of William Randolph Hearst who basically managed all of her career with the exception of one film, her very first film. Uh, and the, all of these pictures featured huge production budgets, mm. uh, massive sets, all the stops were pulled out. As you, if you watch the film already, um, you would notice that these are amazing sets. Uh, they also included uh, top stars of the day, um, Owen Moore, uh, who was, you know, popular star with early Mary Pickford films, was Mary Pickford's first husband. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, he's her co-star. There's a number of other uh, people in the cast, um, like Louise Fazenda, who plays Gretchen, the burgomaster's daughter, who, do, who also has a romance that's uh, going on in the film. And Louise Fazenda was another female comedian uh, starting out with Max Sennett, did all kinds of comedy films and also was uh, the inspiration for people like Minnie Pearl that came along oh, later. Really? She got very much into dressing very frumpy and dowdy and being kind of like a country bumpkin person. But a lot of the people in this had, you know, big careers like Carl Dane, who plays um, Louise Fazenda's love interest, Captain Jacob. Um, he was, he kind of, his career kind of got launched in the big parade. Mm -hmm. um, with, that was King Vidor's kind of masterpiece, 1925 film on World War I. Um, uh, so, but all of the films featured top stars, top designers, uh, everything. And the other aspect for Marion Davies, the most uh, publicity uh, of any star in yeah. Hollywood during her era, thanks to her boyfriend, William Randolph Hearst. <laughs> Who uh, owned how many newspapers and yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, and here um, is, an, we believe it's an original poster because we're looking at that Metro Goldwyn Mayer logo down in the lower corner okay. there. Yes. Um, and I also just happened to have, this film was, uh, if you want to switch back off the screen with the, uh, images. Yeah, great. I also like, let me just turn off um, my background here so I can show this. Uh, hold on just a second. I'm just going to flip this. You have a film noir poster yeah, in the background. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, this is like oh. a handbill from the musical of the Red. Yeah, based on, yeah. 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 And the musical was super, super successful. People loved it. 
Um, and that was probably the one criticism this film got was that um, it wasn't a musical. And people were like, oh. well, how can we go to a Victor Herbert musical, but it's a silent film. Um, so it got some, you know, bad reviews. Um, it did okay, you know, it did fine at the box office, but the problem, and uh, that's kind of, let me just say that a little clearer, because the William Randolph Hearst being wanting her to have these mega productions, yeah. her films had to make like a fortune to make a profit. And this was my understanding, it, it did not. I think on IMDb, it says it did. But when I look through uh, the stats of the box office for her films. Yeah. It, you know, it looks like it made a little money, but I don't know with all the promotion and all the other print costs, uh, negative, you know, all that. I don't know that it, I think it kind of went in the red. Um, but it, you look back, you watch it today, it's so charming. Um, she really, um, had something that the public liked. Audiences really liked her. Um, she, some of her films made a lot of money, particularly the films after this were some of her best films. Uh, her career went well into the sound era. Uh, she had some hit films in that, particularly, I think, Go in Hollywood with Bing Crosby, I think was a big hit. Um, she retired due to her own decision at age 40. Um, and considering that she also was all her life had a stammer or a stutter, mm -hmm. um, she did amazing doing sound films. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think what's maybe one of the most remarkable things about her is Hearst didn't like that. He, he didn't appreciate comedy. He didn't value it. Right. It was really her strong point. Uh, she clowned all the time in her personal life. She had was full of one-liners. Uh, she completely charmed G George Bernard Shaw. They became lifelong friends, at least as long as his life lasted. Um, people commented on her being one of the most authentic people they ever, had ever met in mm -hmm. Hollywood. Um, and somehow she managed to be known as her career went on as more as a comedian. Uh, she managed to survive William Randolph Hearst's overzealous promoting of her. Yeah. He almost embarrassingly uh, had these ridiculous, you know, just over the top praise reviews. Everyone that worked on his papers had to praise her to the skies. It was almost laughable. Yeah. Uh, and yet she managed to rise above that and other papers, rec other critics recognized in certain films of hers how good she was. I'm glad we know more about her. And of course, there's a lot more visibility with the recent film Mank by David Fincher and Amanda right. Britt is up for a supporting Academy Award. And of course, um, besides all her comedian work and her films, she was a great party thrower uh, at the Horse Mansion. And, and I know Chaplin came there to party. Um, yeah. One other little film note, when you see the director's credit on the film, it doesn't necessarily say Fatty Arbuckle, doesn't it have his pseudonym? Yeah, which it's it's William B. Goodrich or shortened to Will B. Good, kind of yeah. christened by Buster <laughs> Keaton. Uh, and it is very heartbreaking. You know, if you, there's books written on Fatty Arbuckle's um, scandal documentaries. Yeah. Uh, he was very unfairly targeted by a district attorney in San Francisco who basically was blackmailing wit witnesses to testify against Arbuckle. Um, and I think her paper added to the vitriol uh, of just basically prosecuting him in the press uh, and convicting him in the press. And there was no way he was going to come back from that. It, it, it is, there have been people that said that Marion Davies got him this gig as director hmm. uh, and her memoir, which you never know with her memoir because she was pretty much drunk while she dictated it. Yeah, she was a big uh, drinker. She was a big drinker. Uh, um, and I think the recordings, it was all recorded. And so it's, it's uh -huh. just hard to know about the accuracy. She said Nick Skink 
it was responsible for hiring Fatty on the film. Um, not she, but then she is a person that did not take credit for things. Well, of course, uh, we know we know that the word scandal <laughs> sells papers, gets people yeah. attention, yeah. all of that. So we called this comedy classics. Before we open it up to Q and A, I just wanted to have a little free for all here on, and you all can talk about each of the, you don't have to stay with Mary and Janice, or you can talk about Chaplin and keep too, but um, let's go back to Jennifer. Mm -hmm. What makes Chaplin, Keaton, Marianne Davies funny? Well, it's a, what's funny, <laughs> if I may. I mean, both funny, haha, but also kind of funny, yeah. ironic. Yeah. You know, like, oh, that's a little funny. That's a little strange. It's like, one of the things that Marianne Davies was so well known of, as I know Janice knows, is, is all those parties where you mentioned Janice, you know, where she's like entertaining this. She would do these impersonations of all the stars and she was so good at it and there's only one moment um where on film she does those but it, it, at that at time she 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 imitates chaplin now oh yeah yeah marion davies imitation of chaplin is one of the best ones that i've seen but i've seen a many um including she did that imitation of him in the film show people I think it's, I'm trying to, I was at the Patsy, I think. Or the Patsy. The well, Patsy, we yeah. two of her films, uh, Show People and the Patsy and Chaplin's and But I feel mm -hmm. like I've seen that in one of those, but. It's the Patsy, yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a gig with uh, Charlie Chaplin in Show People where she doesn't know who he is. She pretends, yeah. you know, her character doesn't yeah. know who he is. And yeah. that's yeah. pretty yeah. hilarious. And yeah. there's even her running into, I think, herself or something in that one yeah. where she's like, Marion Davies, yeah. who's, you know. You can even think of show people as like a different variation of what John was talking about, of the kind of meta, you know, reflective right. look. But right. show people is about a meta reflective look at kind of the, the culture of, of a newly new place called Hollywood. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, uh, Sherlock Jr. is about how, what is this like magical mechanism that is the cinema um, and the camera and the technology and all of this. And that's part of the, what's really interesting to me about Chaplin is, is how different he is from Keaton in that way. Mm -hmm. In fact, the way John that you were describing him was, uh, Keaton is so, you know, uh, wonderful in a sense of he's fat Keaton's fascinated with technology let's take the camera apart let's see how it works let's see what kind of double exposures what kind of Houdini-esque magic we can perform utilizing all these kind of you know uh, these these uh, technological tricks whereas Chaplin who was directing his own films and writing them mm -hmm. by the mutual period what we're the films we're looking at um, tonight absolutely refused if you notice he doesn't even do close-ups very much. He does not move his camera. He that's creates right. a kind of demarcated space in which it's the body that's going to perform. Yeah. And that, that body is what becomes kind of phenomenally hilarious and also what, you know, all, everyone else is trying to imitate with their own bodies. But if you think about it for a moment, let me put it these terms because I love and I will, I'm going to resist my proclivity to try and imitate Chaplin because as far as <laughs> No, it's very bad. And, uh, <laughs> it was even to the point that I was in a, um, a BBC documentary and we made it in 2006, 2006, 2007 as a part of the kind of release of Chaplin's papers and memos right. um, in both England and Italy. There's the Chaplin Progetto has come together. And um, I was a part of a documentary that Robert Downey Jr. Uh, w was uh, a part of because he had played After Chaplin he did the in the film? biopic okay. and Downey Jr. came and worked with us. We were at the BFI and mm -hmm. um, and he they included it in the BBC documentary where he says, I think Professor Jennifer Bean has a case of Chaplinitis. <laughs> and he's talking and they he that my voice being recorded of like, I do, I do. I, I you know, I've got my hey, case. you gotta uh, you gotta save that for the archives. But nonetheless, what is it about Chaplin? The way that what is he like, what is this mimicry? What is it that he's doing with his body? Well, think about it in terms of a joke, literally the punchline of a joke is a moment when meaning flips over. I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good pun off the top of my head. I can't think of one, but if you play with a joke, 
that meaning where one line of meaning flips over and becomes the other meaning and you, you they're both there well, and you simultaneously. Really, you really see that in the shorts that that we yeah. featured too. In Think all about- three of those shorts, you you really see that. Mm-hmm. I want to switch to um hold that hold that thought, yeah. Jennifer. I want to switch to um trying to be even with all of our stars here. Um, John, what makes Keaton funny? Well, Keaton you know, like I mentioned earlier, honed his craft in front of audiences. So he really started to learn what made people laugh. Yeah. And in his case, what people made made people laugh is him not reacting. Oh. He became known as, later in his life the as the great face. stone face. Yes. But his father, Joe Keaton, who was incidentally in Sherlock Jr., yes. um, always would shout at him, you know, face, face, face buster. And he would learn how not to, and, and, and so he, he creates this character that's, there's the, that everyone else is in hysterics and he's, he's just almost melancholic, you know? Yeah. And um, he's also, because he understands how comedy works, for him, it's about violation of expectation. You know, you think this is going to happen. Oh. And this happens instead. And then when that happens, if you're going to really keep the laughs going, you have to top the topper. So you've got a a thing that everybody's, oh, that's the joke. And then, no, this is the joke. No, this is the joke. And he's always finding a way to take whatever's happening and top the topper. I love that phrase, violation of expectation. So each step of the way, like, like, you know, there's a scene of him sweeping up in front of the uh, theater. You know, it's the simplest gag ever, right? This woman comes, attractive woman comes and says, I lost a dollar. And he's trying to save up money and he has $2 and he wants, needs one more to buy this box of $3 candy for his girlfriend. But he, and he finds the dollar and he's going to, and he, so he's all happy. And she comes and says, she lost a dollar. Can you describe it to me? I know. I lo- so he's, and not only is she describing it, she's looking over his shoulder oh. to describe the dollar. <laughs> the, the actress playing that inter- in- interestingly is so, uh, Doris Dean, who mm. is Patty Arbuckle's wife. Okay, there you go. It's all connected, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, also, isn't uh, it true, John, that, um, if I may interject something, isn't sure. it true that Keaton used, in all of his features, very few intertitles? That's true, because, you know, he, he for him, it was a visual medium. Yeah. And, and intertitles for him was a, a defeat. It mm. meant you know, unless you, unless, if you couldn't tell it visually, then you'd throw in an inner title to explain something. But, you know, um, and he honed and honed this film. The film is only 45 minutes long. Yes. It's actually about a reel and a half short for what would have been considered a feature in those days. Um, and that's because he tested it and tested it in front of audiences and decided, you know, it really needed, this is the length it needed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the essence, isn't it? Yeah. It- it's the essence. The other, thing about, the other thing I want to say, though, about, about Keaton, if I may, is that yeah. his, the, the other thing about his humor is, um, and Keaton had, uh, Chaplin had this as well, of course, but Keaton's physical skills yeah. oh, were those amazing stars. because he um, was a fanatic on perfection. He practiced yep. and practiced and practiced. And certain things in Sherlock Jr. camera magic but certain things like the pool table sequence, yeah, he shot real time all of those shots, which are impossible. They're impossible. I heard that what he did is he coated the balls with like talcum powder yeah. and practiced the shot so he could see exactly where each oh ball went. went back, did it again, set it up, shot it again. And essentially that's how Keaton became funny, effortlessly funny by insanely practicing everything he had to do physically till he had it perfectly. Yeah. Janice, or excuse me, um, Jennifer, you had something quick and then I want to go to Janice. It was just the idea of like the topper that is so wonderfully put, John, in terms of Keaton, but that provides a nice way of comparing Keaton with Chaplin, which is that Chaplin repeats, everything is a different version of another kind of iteration of a joke. So that yeah. with the famous clock sequence in Pawn Shop where yes. he's miming and he's he's creating different meanings. So the clock becomes in his hands as he dismantles it. It's like he holds it up with a stethoscope. It's like a heart, 
So it's kind of a clock, but it's also a heart. And then he uh, starts to unwind it and it's like a can of sardines, but it's also a clock. And then it becomes, he, all the innards come out on the thing and he squirts right. them and it's like a bunch of insects, but it's still a clock. In the same way that in the, you know, a moment in the beginning of the film where he's like uh, sweeping out the, um, the room and he turns around, there's a string on the floor and then he starts to walk on it and it becomes a tightrope. Each of these is just another version of the same. You repeat everything in the tramps world is a form of play. Yeah. It's something that is like, can become different, but there is no growth, no pro progression, no kind of like transition to something else. That's why the famous image of the tramp is that he just walks off down the road. I love that within the, the 1920s. Okay. Whereas with Keaton, as you're saying, John, it's like another level, another level, another level. It keeps kind of, you know, one-upping himself in this like technologically like- And both of those- way. Both of those, Two directors, actors, imagination, improvisation, extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. Janice, before we open it up to a Q&A, if you can give us a little bit of juice on what you think is funny about Marion Davies, particularly in The Red Mill. Well, you know, I think one of the things about her is she has this infectiousness mm. uh, and sense of playfulness. Um, I sort of, you know, she was often in the press more about her, you know, social life with William Randolph Hearst. Yeah. They, they were famous for the large parties that he had at San Simeon, his Xanadu like uh, palace. Uh, but it was people like to come there like Chaplin because of her. Mm -hmm. uh, she was so charming and infectious, filled with pranks. That's just what she did as a person. She did all those imitations uh, that Jennifer was mentioning. She did those first at these parties um, and people witnessed them. Um, it's also really felt that Chaplin really, uh, who became a good friend, possibly a lover, that was never, no one really knows, but they were good friends for years. And uh, many people feel like he kind of encouraged her uh, in the comedy. Um, one of the things that happened was, and she is sort of thought of as that great silent film comedian, a la Mabel Norman, because when Mabel Norman faded out of the picture, uh, Irving Thalberg, the head of production at MGM, he, he felt like you need to take over this mantle to her. And because oh, now yeah. she was the cosmopolitan pictures owned by the rich Randolph, William Randolph Hearst were now at home at MGM. And so that started her working also with King Vidor, with the Patsy and show people uh, two of, you know, Vidor's really great pictures yeah. too. Um, and I, th I just um, think that all of a sudden it, it, there got to be a little more permission uh, to do the comedies. William Randolph, one little quick thing was William Randolph Hearst had so many people tell, her, tell him she's so good at comedy. Francis Marion, who wrote this movie. And oh, Francis Marion, can we say. Mm -hmm. Yes, great, one of the great silent yes. screenwriters. Oh, um, she, yeah, she kept telling Hearst, yeah. Marion's fabulous at comedy, and he would just be deaf. He wanted her in costume drama, dramas. He fantasized her being like um, Gloria Swanson, Mary Pickford level. He just could not um, back off from these weird fantasies he had of what Marion should be. Yeah, well, so, I'm glad she forged her way. She did. Forged her way yeah. through. Thank you, Janice, for mentioning Mabel Norman because of course she was a major star of her own right and doing so many things with Chaplin. And um, there will be, the season isn't announced next year, but this is kind of pandemic postponements. Here we go. But um, we will focus on uh, female filmmakers next season. Um, I can't really say the films right now, but we're going to get inside of, you know, some of the major filmmakers and screenwriters like Frances Marion. So, I'm, you know, we sometimes forget the women who, you know, were very famous at the time, but we just don't know now. So thank you guys. I mean, we can keep going, keep going, but I want to give enough time for any questions. I'm thinking that once, I mean, my sense is no, that 
that once Chaplin oh. and Pickford and Fairbanks and Griffith, they form United Artists in 1919 and pretty they much, you know, Chaplin's working on his own, but I could be wrong. They you did know, work on Limelight together. together. There is, isn't Buster, I think Buster- Is there a scene in Limelight? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yes, yes. Much okay. But don't you imagine that there had to be some crossover? Yeah. Well, they, they, certainly, they certainly knew each other. And I think, oh, yeah. also, uh, uh, I know, I know Keaton uh, kind of uh, satirized Chaplin and vice versa. You know, they, yeah. they, they enjoyed each other's company. There's pictures of them, you know, together. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you think he I, satirized Chaplin in a film anywhere or just? No, not in a film, but, okay. but you know, they, like publicity stills and things like oh, that. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, you know, I mean, and Keaton too is one of the few of the major comics of, of the comedians of the 1920s who did not imitate Chaplin early yeah. on. Right. Like Harold Lloyd, before yeah. he developed the glasses <laughs> characters, Glasses character around 1918, 1919. Before then, he was imitating Chaplin the way that Billy West did, and Billy Ritchie, and Charles Amador, and you know, yeah. Charles Amador changed his name to Charles Applin, and then Chaplin oh, hey. in court <laughs> in 1925. That's a fun uh, court case, but um, but but not Keaton. Jennifer. Oh, that's a great question. I um, I don't know. What I do know is that um, it, there's a lot of effort that's been put into recovering the um, the Chaplin uh, Keystones, which mm. were like thirties four films he made in one year in in 1914 and. And those are available now. I mean, they've been restored and it's it's a part of what we were all working on back in 2006, 2007 at the, uh, with the BFI and with the Chaplin Progetto, which is in, um, it's based in Udine, it's U-D-I-N-E yes. in Italy. And you can look it up because they have a digital online database now that's searchable for Chaplin's letters and memos and different like little bits of uh, fragments of films of what he cut out of what he didn't use in his films. You can access some of that online. In terms of a Blu-ray, I don't know uh, about a high, a high definition. I know that there are some members of the international film preservation community who resist moving in that direction because it's not reflective of the kind of nitrate cellulose base on which Chaplin, you know, and all and all everyone else, you know, the whole silent era yeah. made their films. Um, well, I'm glad you talked <laughs> talked about that because there's just so much focus now on restoration and all the digitizing, and of course Sherlock Jr. I can't remember what year, but it wasn't that long ago. There was a 4K restoration of it, so this work keeps keeps going and we are really glad it does. Well, in, in Sherlock Jr., that, that's a film that's unusual in that it doesn't have really any ethnic representations or characters. So I might uh, turf that over to Jennifer because the immigrant, the pawn shop. Yeah. I'm gonna throw in one, I'm gonna throw in one thing historically oh god i'm forgetting the year now but um seattle theater group partnered with uh moma in presenting this um restoration of burt williams lime kiln club short film and if you look at burt williams in that film mm -hmm. and his walk he was african-american and his walk and his big shoes mm -hmm. and his pants when I saw it, I went, uh, Chaplin, did mm -hmm. you, <laughs> were you influenced by Burt Williams? There were lots of people I mean, who called yeah. in that era, called Burt Williams the funniest man. I ever. know. Yeah. And he was very Adams. funny. But a part of what, I mean, I, I would just say that, uh, first of all, I would just want to say it's a brilliant question. 
Um, and it's absolutely crucial um, to thinking about this period. You cannot think about comedy in this period without thinking about the history of minstrelsy um, and about blackface performance. Um, and you see that uh, among other forms of, of ethnic performing. In fact, comedy was associated with ethnic identity. And one of the ways that the chaplain kind of separates himself from the Keystone crowd is to become the tramp, the kind of homeless person he begins to, or, yeah. I mean, I'm using that term in a, in a newer way, um, versus the kind of Jewish and German and Yiddish uh, types of characters who are populating Keystone. But what Chapman doesn't do is play with the idea of blackface. Now, now Keaton does, not in Sherlock Jr., but if you think of like one of his shorts, like Neighbors from 1919 uh, or 1920, uh, where he's just, he'll just, go running down the street and he's like, gotta get the girl and he's you know, doing all kinds of acrobatics. But at one moment, like a, a bucket of paint will fall on him and he escapes from the police as it were, they're walking by, they're looking for him by turning one side of his face to the camera, it's covered in paint and it's dark. And then oh. he turns the other side of his face and it's white. Now that was so prevalent, it, it's appearing everywhere. I would argue that it is an illusion that's constantly, constantly happening. That's referring back to, to minstrelsy and to blackface performing, which was so popular. And I have to say in the Red Mill, I think about it at that moment. It's such an amazing visual moment when we have the camera, the close up on Marion Davies face. And it's like, the idea is plot motivation is she's like encased in ice, but there's a moment where she smiles and the ice kind of breaks off her face. I think that's an illusion. It's like another form of play yeah. with that idea of, of, of corking up, of masking up, of transforming your identity um, and to play with other forms of ethnic and racial identity that was just so, it, it appears in so many ways. Um, well, Keaton did, Keaton actually did appear in blackface in some of his uh, he did. shorts, yeah. But they were peripheral. Like you know, there's a there's a scene where he does where he plays every person in the theater. He's in the yeah, box, he's in yeah, the audience, the play, the on play stage, yeah. and on the extreme ends are two blackface characters playing rhythm instruments as part of the band. John, uh, what's the name of that? Oh, uh, the Playhouse. Um, what is it called? Is the Playhouse? Yeah, oh, I think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and and for, but for for him, um, he was you know I, I think that was again it, it was more like a trope. It was just a you know a theatrical trope at the time. Yeah. Um, and like so many other things, it was it, it didn't seem to have uh, much beyond that. It was just Janice, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, it's on the previous question because I thought you were done, but I didn't want so I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh. It's yeah. the one about the unknown chaplain. The reason it hasn't come out is it's a rights issue. And it's sadly the situation with a number of, you know, wonderful documentaries like Brown, Kevin Brownlow's Hollywood, which is just this fantastic hours, I forget how many hours long, 13 hours long uh, documentary that can't come out again. It came out on Laserdisc last and it will not be rebroadcast. It will not come out again. Because of the rights from who? Chaplin? There's so many things that they had to clear rights for that, that now it's all changed. So they have to redo all those rights. It's music rights. It's this, it's that. It's just a number oh of different goodness. rights. I've never so seen it's that. Astronomical, like what... Um, what it would cost to clear all those rights. Yeah, and of course, rights with Chaplin, um, you know, the shorts are in public domain, right, Jennifer? But, you mm -hmm. know, all of his features, yeah, you have to use his music and you have to, yeah, a lot mm -hmm. of rights, rights things here. John and Jennifer, what do you got there? I'm not aware that the dailies and the rushes survive from these films. We're, mm -hmm. we're lucky when we have completed films. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. I, I think they, I, I don't think there was any premium on it. I think they just destroyed this stuff awesome. for storage. It was Jennifer, what do, you, what do you think? You know, I am, um, I, I've seen s some more for Keaton, it seems not, not with Sherlock Jr. But um, like with the general, um, and they, and, but I've seen them mostly like on DVDs that, 
-hmm. we'll collect them and are pointing to like locations where he's shot. Yeah. But didn't uh, Keaton, wasn't he a big believer in kind of the one take? Like I got this big stunt, I got this big gag and, and, and we're going to get it in one. <laughs> well, he did a lot where he had to do it in one. I mean, he was, you know, like he threw himself in incredible risks over and over again. And Sherlock Jr., there's a scene where he's running around along the top of a series of box cars. Right. And he grabs a spout and the downspout and, yes. and, and the water hits him. Mm -hmm. Well, the water hit him 10 times harder than he thought it was going to. And he smashed his head Ugh. on the mm -hmm. rail got up, completed the scene, ran away, had a terrible headache, had a couple of drinks, took some aspirin, took a nap, got up the next day and went back to work. Hmm. 11 years later, he goes to the doctor for an x-ray and the doctor says, when did you break your neck? Oh God. With a broken and, neck. Oh God. The one thing that the previous question about the outtakes, David Shepard yes. uh, had the Chaplin outtakes. Um, and I believe they're in the documentary, The Unknown Chaplin, too, or at least there's, I don't know if they're oh, all really? in there. No, no, okay. Some are in there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thought, I, mean, I would also, I would also say that like, one of the things that's really interesting about this whole period, I mean, the 1910s and the 1920s, yes. but also before then, um, is that the idea that there's this original film and that other things are, are outtakes or cut out or whatever, really does not apply in the same way that it does today. By, by which I mean that um, the kind of phenomena say of Chaplin in the 1910s, when I said earlier that everyone was imitating him like in the streets wearing you know, costumes, there are whole companies, the Noida co uh, company that would like sell for five cents, this like Chaplin like mustache and cane and whatever. For, but it's also with the films that they would, they were not copyrighted, they were not protected in the same way and particularly in an international marketplace. Um, and that's the thing with Keaton and with Davies films, I mean, with all of them um, through the 1920s, that was a huge issue so that there's this process of um, what any archivist faces today in the archives around the world, mm -hmm. um, when we put together and try and come up with what we would present on say a DVD or a Blu-ray of here is this film, is it's a process of, of labor of years of comparing the always right. different, radically different prints as they moved through world markets and were um, locally transformed and pieces cut out because they might offend um, one audience or they were too long to fit a certain program or little bits and pieces. And um, it's a fascinating process to kind of like sort through and compare those, particularly with these comedians where sometimes you will see bits that are cut out of one piece and, and put been, in another, like edited into another that would end up in Czechoslovakia where Buster Keaton does appear alongside Chaplin briefly because <laughs> film is manipulable that way. That's right. Someone, a local exhibitor, a uh, local proje uh, projectionist, kind of like Keaton's projectionist doing magic, just wanted it that way. Um, and a, we're still- a, In Sherlock Jr. where he's he, in one of, in the montage sequence, he ends up in a lion's cage. Yes. You know? And that shot made Keaton very nervous and he had a really hard time because he yeah, didn't know what yeah, the gate yeah. was and they got up and they started. And so he went out and he turned to, uh, his cameraman Leslie and he said, um, "I'm one take." He said, "Well, we got to we got to shoot a second one for 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 the European release." And he said, "Europe ain't gonna see that scene." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In oh, fact, I love that similar similar phenomena. If you look at um, anyone who's watching, if you haven't seen Chaplin's The Circus from 1928, I love. We've shown we, that. We showed at the it at Paramount Paramount about I don't know eight uh, eight years ago or five years ago, but also similar seen with a lion in a in a cage. In fact, the lion was so prevalent and so many women stars, not Marion Davies, but others who would perform alongside of these big cats. It's why MGM <clears throat> has the 1920s, their logo, which still is the MGM logo, yes. you're familiar with it, is the roaring lion, you know, in the I middle of the frame. 
Well, silent films in general have animals all the time. There are a lot of kitty cats. I love the little mouse coming out of the Dutch wooden shoe and in the Red Mill. And what's so exciting about what you guys know and why we all are still passionate about silent movies is we're still learning more about it. Things are being discovered. Mm -hmm. We're finding films still, you know, in barns and basements and Mm -hmm. tundras. But I really appreciate the three J's, Jennifer, Janice, and John. We can make a song there. (laughs) And uh, I hope that viewers and future viewers will take some time to see these films, all of Chaplin, but particularly The Immigrant, Pawn Shop, and Easy Street. Sherlock Jr. is brilliant. We've shown a lot of of Keaton at the Paramount. Mm -hmm. And of course, Marion Davies and The Red Mill and other things. We hope... We pray we'll be back in the Paramount with the Mighty Willitzer and musicians next season and uh, Silent Movie Mondays live on. Thank you all so much. Loved having you here. Okay. Okay. (laughs) And cheers. Thanks for everybody watching. Yeah. (laughs) We'll see you all soon at the movies. Okay. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Best to all of you. Oh, <laughs>